Good evening. My name is Kid Sheehan, and I don't hear the speaker very well over here, so I don't know if there's an issue. I didn't, uh, <coughs> hello, testing, testing, testing. There you go. Okay, there we go. We just make sure we, everybody can hear me. Don't want to speak in a vacuum. <laughs> now, my name is Kit Sheehan. I'm the pastor teacher for tonight. Uh, I apologize for not being here last week, but we had weather problems and power problems, and uh, so we just uh, waited, and that gave me a, a chance to to think about all that was happening, especially when we're sitting in the dark with candles at night. Um, and and so I put together something uh, just uh, as I learned stuff. I put it down on a on a, on a PowerPoint. So I passed out copies here. I'm not going to put that on the internet until uh, I may put it on there later uh, on my own web, uh, Facebook page. That uh, um, it just as I was getting into and, and researching what happened and why, I, I learned a lot of things. And well, some of these I might have heard, but just kind of I tried to put them all together. And and this is a, I put I put on here draft. Because I'm still working on it, but I thought that it might be useful and helpful to to share with what I've got so far. So, uh, uh, kind of what what happened, and we we we've been here uh, we've been here before. And uh, 2011, we had, uh, and, and I understand in 1989 they had another one. And I'm sure there are other years where where people lost power in, in individual places. Um, but uh, and, and we heard uh, Governor Abbott. Uh, a few days ago, talk about that we had a pro we had this problem in 2011, and and uh, that there were some suggestions, uh, but they were voluntary, so everybody left them voluntary and and just went about their business, perhaps without doing anything. I don't know, but uh, I, on the way here, I heard at the end of a, a, a press conference or speech by Governor Abbott saying, "By golly, he's not letting the legislature go home until this problem is fixed." Well. We'll see. Oh, that, uh, uh, as at one of my my final slides, uh, slides is uh, the future, more government. <laughs> so I'm afraid that's where we're headed, but we'll see. Um, now I put here the 2011 power outage. I, I went back and I've tried to document each and everything. That I, so essentially, I'm like a reporter here. But I, I wanted to, as I learn stuff, I decided I would would. Uh, Put it uh, on, on a PowerPoint, and then at the bottom or someplace, document what page, I, what web page I got it from. So if somebody wanted to, to, to get uh, something, and and I made reference to something called the Wayback Machine. Um, that that's uh, an archive where lots of the the web is archived to this Wayback Machine. The idea is it's way back. So there are articles, newspaper, and I got some from here. From that machine, it's not really way. Uh, I think it used to be called Wayback uh, .org or com or something, but right now it's archive .org. Anyhow, uh, on on uh, February second, this was in 2011, not 2021. Uh, Texas uh, forced outages at two major coal-fired power plants and high electricity demand due to cold weather caused rolling blackouts affecting more than one million customers. The grid operator declared an emergency, energy emergency, after unusually frigid weather shut down 7,000 megawatts of power generators, about 8% of the installed capacity in the second most populous state. Spot power prices surged 60-fold at one point, and Mexico exported electricity. Um, uh, so we issued, they had some time, six months after that, they issued a report, and I, I put at the bottom here where you can find that 357 page report and no I haven't read it uh, that would take a while and uh, uh, I may at some future date read it and see what's said but I'm not going to go there right now so uh, I have uh, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on these slides I've got probably enough slides to cover a whole hour but I just gonna, 15 or 20 minutes is sufficient um, and you've got the handout so uh, we, we kind of we pretty much know uh, that there was a power outage, and uh, I know in my house it was supposed to be rolling power blackout for 45 minutes, no more than 45 minutes. But after about four hours, I decided, I realized, well, it's not 45 minutes. <laughs> it's a little longer than that, and this is a little less than uh, than control. But at least we didn't lose the, the, the grid totally. 
Uh, and that was their fear that if they just left the power on, that, that it would burn itself out or something and everything is gone. And now we've got a real problem. Um, and we, you've heard this term, uh, ERCOT. Uh, that's the, those are the people that, that manage the power in Texas. And I'll get to why they manage it and not somebody else. Uh, and I've got the, the, again, this is from their own website, ERCOT.com. And, Electric Reliability Council of Texas. And as I saw someone say on Facebook, they aren't very reliable. <laughs> well, we didn't have a lot of electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? I have this quote here and I can read it. Some of these are from uh, uh, newspapers and this one's from a TV uh, station, I think. So, uh, so what happened? The equipment failure turned out to be a big part of the problem. Beginning around 11... PM Sunday night. This is, I guess, the seventh of February. Uh, multiple generating units began tripping offline in rapid progression due to the severe cold weather. Said Dan Woodfin, senior director of the system operations at ERCOT, the organization that manages the state's electric grid. What does that mean? Equipment literally froze in the single-digit temperatures and stopped working. Then. As reserves diminished, ERCOT asked transmission providers to turn off large industrial users that had previously agreed to be shut down. But the situation deteriorated quickly, requiring rotating outages that had lasted hours for many Texans. On Sunday, the grid operator said it had set a new record for peak energy demand during the winter. 69,150 megawatt more than the... Uh, more, uh, more than uh, 3,200 megawatts higher than the prior winter peak in January 2018. It also asked Texans to conserve energy as much as possible. Uh, energy experts say the problems in Texas go beyond reliance on renewable energy sources. And that was one of the reasons why I, I decided to look at this is I had people on uh, conservatives saying that, that so-and-so renewable energy, that's why. And then you had people like AOC, or at least reportedly said, well, Texas needs uh, 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 the Green New Deal. Well, what's the real, what's the deal? What's the, what's the real? <laughs> so, and so you got two extremes, and I think both sides miss it. And it's a complicated problem. And I, put, I started putting stuff on my own Facebook page that when you have a real bad problem like this, it usually is a result of several failures, not just a single failure. So you've got uh, different things that, are, that happened. But uh, as, as I said on the, my Facebook page, um, there's a basic issue. Uh, so the supply and demand were in an imbalance. You had more demand than you had supply. That's the easy answer. Yes? It, it seems like what you're saying there, the more you need it, the less it will be available. Well, that's what happened yeah. uh, due to the weather, uh, because the weather uh, caused uh, so outages. If it's cold, you'll have less. Fuel. Yeah, yeah, you got, less more, yeah, you got the more cold it got, uh, the more people wanted it, and and the uh, the more the failures. So, you, so you had two uh, uh, two forces acting that, that caused uh, the problem to get out of hand. One was. Uh, uh, I assume that lots of people use uh, electricity for heating the house. I use gas, but the, uh, you, if you've got space heaters, and so people got cold, so they turn on their electricity, and the, and the demand went way above uh, normal. I guess it, if, if it set, set records as far as how, how much demand there was. And then stuff started going offline, and so your, your supply goes down, your demand goes up, and there's this big gap in the middle, and, and rather than burn it out, uh, trying to supply it, uh, uh, it's like like uh, like at home. If you plug in uh, uh, something that's uh, a high wattage that, that that your circuit breaker won't work, the circuit breaker pops. So nobody gets any electricity then. So they had to to, to distribute the electricity. And we'll get to the point. Uh, I'll, I'll get a little bit here. Well, why couldn't I get electricity from the rest of the United States? Well, there's a reason for that. Yeah. I know. The other thing is, don't forget, there's many, many houses that are like mine are electric heat. Yeah, know? yeah, and that, I referenced that. Yeah, there's some people, there's a lot of houses that are that heat with electricity, and the colder it got, the more you turn up the heat just to keep the temperature somewhere around 65 degrees <laughs> or, or, or maybe a little higher or maybe a little lower, whatever it would take. Why well, would you say God decided to let it go? Well, that was it. Obviously, well, uh, uh, 
certainly God had a had a I knew this was coming, and uh, he's probably sitting up there laughing at those idiots <laughs> if they'd have just listened to me. <laughs> so wind turbines in the state froze due to the cold temperatures, taking those offline. But even more natural gas, coal, and nuclear power were unavailable. Wade Shower, research director of America's Power and Renewables at Wood McKenzie, told Bloomberg he estimated around 27 gigawatts of coal nuclear gas weren't available over the weekend, especially as the cold temperatures drove demand up for natural gas, gas heating. And it wasn't just Texas. I mean, we're not the only state that's had problems. Uh, and, and California's had, had their rolling blackouts. You've seen that a few months ago, maybe. Um, and, and so... Uh, asking the question why electric generating plants did not properly winterize their equipment, said David Tuttle in the latest episode of the All Lytics uh, po Political Podcast. Tuttle is a research associate with the Energy Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. There are things that can be done, but it will cost some money, he added. About every decade, we have these long sustained periods, and then you know weatherization is supposed to happen, and then it doesn't because it costs money. So if uh, Governor Abbott's going to make sure it gets fixed, well, then money's going to magically appear from somewhere, so that may mean more taxes. Well, so that, that's part of why I wanted to, to, to put this together, because people I don't want people to be, well, why do we have to have more taxes? Well, here's why. They're trying to fix a problem. But, uh, uh, and again, it's, uh, the government's trying to fix the problem, so it's going to cost you more money. You'll pay more money to fix it, and then you'll pay more money to buy it. This, I, I, I could spend all hour on, on this, this chart. I, I put a special post on my Facebook page on it. Uh, on, on, during that two week period, uh, this is the hour by hour uh, um, graph of the generation of electricity from the different sources. So the, the big one there is uh, natural gas. That produces a lot, lots of electricity there. And, and you see the, there's almost a straight line across there. That's nuclear, that's the red one. Uh, and you see the solar, it got a little blip, blip, blip. Well, the reason for that, solar only works during the daytime. It doesn't work at night. You can't, so, so it's gonna be blip, 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 blip. Uh, it, it added a little bit, but not a whole lot. And then you see that green line. It starts out, it almost goes up to 25. That's wind power, and wind power, uh, if I looked up the statistics, uh, uh, this ERCOT, they have, uh, they have more data on, the elect on electricity than, than uh, I could, uh, I mean, you're looking at this, your eyes glaze over, uh, uh, but if you find the right page, you can get some really informa good information, and this one, it didn't actually come directly from ERCOT, it came from this uh, U.S. government, uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, but it, it it tells a story, and here you have. And now this is only the supply uh, story, not not the demand. So I can't, I don't have another graph of that yet. But it shows that the green, well, they were they were doing pretty good there. That's the wind power, and then all of a sudden it goes zzz, as the turbines froze, and so uh, you see that the, the, they still had some some uh, turbines online. But they, they lost, uh, I, I think uh, I saw some estimates, 50 to 60% of, of turbine power was, was lost because the, the turbines froze. It wasn't that it was renewable energy, it was that there, it wasn't properly winterized. And that was what Governor Abbott had mentioned, is that that report in, in, uh, in, from 2011 said that there were some things people could do like winterize. And of course, the question would be, winterize to what level? Uh, do I do I winterize to zero degrees, um, or what if if are we are we going into global warming like some people would say or others would say we're going into a period of global cooling because as I've mentioned before the possibility that we're, we're we have uh, fewer sunspots. Well, does that mean that that in a couple of years that we might even be worse than what we had this year? I, I mean, if we're going into global cooling, that's a possibility. But we don't know. We don't. We can't predict the weather. But so what? So the question then becomes: What do you winterize to? What's the standard? Um, so if they winterize to what we have today or this past well, this month, uh, what uh, uh, what happens if, if it gets even worse? 
or will they or will we have reserve capability they've got to come up with something i don't i can't i don't wave a magic wand and but obviously natural gas was a winner here uh yeah there was some some degradation because at, at some point they uh, the, the the valves froze or they couldn't get the gas out of the ground uh, different different reasons but uh uh and certainly from this graph uh, this this is uh, but wasn't there some kind of federal regulation that the new administration signed re reducing our ability or our to produce gas uh well there's the the, the uh, keystone pipeline yeah. uh, that's coming down from canada uh that 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 uh that would bring in a great amount of of uh, natural gas from canada down to the the middle section or some i don't know where all it would go but uh, that, Certainly, that uh, um, uh, could reduce stuff, and that's that's what I'm going to get to. I, I really want to spend a lot more time on on this graph, but I, I need to move on. I've got about five minutes more before we need to go into prayer. Um, um, now, I mentioned that we couldn't, we we can't get uh, power from the rest of the United States, and the reason is we're separated from them. Um, uh, we're part of the Texas interconnection. Good for us. And That's and right. and um, okay. I'll get I, maybe I can say it here right now. The reason is something called the the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. If you cross state boundaries, the feds can come in and regulate you. And Texas doesn't want to be regulated by the federal government. Right. So so we're a bunch of individualists, and we'll we'll survive. Um, uh, but that's that's the point of that's why we are separated i think and that, there's a lot of history by behind that and it's going to take me a while to, to go through that no you got you, you hit the nail on the head that's a long very long story short yeah they did not want me to have any control from the federal government that's what i researched so here's here's the the, the our, our american transmission grids you've got the major ones the eastern and the western and i think some years ago i don't know maybe it wasn't too long ago maybe four or five years ago that uh, the uh, Connecticut, New yes. York, that it failed, yeah. and so they had to connect up to the Western or something. So every once in a while, even the, even the, the these other major grids that are crossing state lines and are regulated by the feds, and then you've got the minor interconnect interconnections, Texas, which is independent, the Quebec and Alaska, and then there's a kind of a little map of that. Now, when I say Texas is independent, that's not 100% true. If you look at at uh, the, the Panhandle, that they're part of a different, and over in El Paso, they're part of, and then you've got something over in the east that's part of Louisiana. But the, the main central part of Texas is in, in the Texas Interconnect. Um, so we're separate. Uh, like somebody <coughs> said here in the Wikipedia, Texas Interconnection is maintained as a separate grid for political rather than technical reasons, but can also draw some power from other grids using DC ties. By not crossing state lines, the synchronous power grid is in most respects not subject to federal, Federal Energy Regulation Commission regulation. Um, and so I, I've already mentioned it's based upon the Constitution and there's something from, uh, uh, as I do, went through the searching, it just happened to get the Cornell Law School, so I, I thought that was uh, good. Cornell uh, That was what they, it's law, so. Um, um, uh, somebody, this is the Washington Examiner. I think that's the. Uh, I've seen several good articles out of out of them. Texas also has heavy renewable energy penetration, particularly wind power, on its electric electricity grid. But much of that has occurred due to market forces rather than policy incentives or renewable energy targets. Now there has been some. Um, uh, what do they call that? Uh, um, lost the word. Where, where, where the government pays uh, money. Subsidies. Subsidies, yes. It's a dirty word, so Billions I didn't want to. dollars. Yes, subsidies. yes. And I think a lot of that is in tax, uh, um, in, the, in the area of tax, where they don't have to pay tax or something. Some of that is, 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 uh, is uh, expiring, but uh, uh, they don't mention that here. But uh, uh, that's... that. I don't mind uh, renewable energy as long as it can support itself. I don't want to pay uh, to build it, to sustain it, and then to, to, to pay extra money to buy from it. Well, uh, 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 wait, they just if they can't if they can't stand on their own two feet. Sustainable, then is it? <laughs> well, there. 
So uh, uh, it looked like uh, uh, you've got lots of politicians making noise. Here's one. Uh, this is from uh, a, a state representative or a Democrat. A state that prides itself on energy production left millions of its citizens to freeze in the dark. It's just not it's, it's not just incompetent, it's criminal. State Representative James Talariaco, Round Rock Democrat, said on Twitter, the Texas legislature must hold hearings, demand answers, and ensure this never happens again. I've been without power and heat for 30 hours. I just got enough cell signal to send this tweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a natural disaster. It's the years of underinvestment, deregulation, and neglect. Texas, your government failed you. Well, um, uh, here was from uh, George P. Bush. Yeah, uh, the Texas Land Commissioner. In the last few days, have proven anything is that we need oil and gas. Bush tweeted, and relying solely on renewable energy would be catastrophic. Many of these sources have proven to be unreliable. We must move forward to an all-encompassing approach to energy. And and uh, so the political lines are drawn. Uh, the pressure is on. And and uh, buckle your seatbelts, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye bye. <laughs> Yeah. Good job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, let me get, uh, let's see, judges. Hopefully I got the right version here. Um, before we get into the study, we'll uh, uh, do a couple minutes of prayer here. Um, as always, I pray for the uh, the various pastors, starting with Herman and Judith and uh, Chris and Phil and me and uh, Robbie Dean and John Hintz. Uh, um, and we have a number of people that are in the congregation that need our prayers. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the list. I don't have a list in front of me here, but um, that, that list has gone out. And so if you review that list when you're, when you're doing your prayers each day, um, uh, and especially pray for America. Uh, we're having troubles, but I, I do find sometimes that uh, uh, God has a way of working things out where you see that uh, uh, Governor Cuomo is getting attacked by the progressives. Uh, you see that Biden is getting pro by, uh, attacked by other Democrats, progressives. So um, uh, maybe the conservatives just got to sit back and watch them uh, destroy each other. I don't know. I mean, it's in God's plan, whatever it's in God's plan. But uh, it's like, uh, and we'll see when we get to Gideon, where all they had to do was kind of watch and all their, their enemies were fighting each other. They got all mixed up and started fighting each other. And they just stood there. And, and then, then after it was all over, oh, look at all the booty that's down there, all the gold. And <laughs> all the, oh, we got to go get. So they spent three days, I think it was, uh, ransacking the, the tents and everything, taking all the goodies and bringing them on home. <laughs> so, I'll vote for that. So let's, let's go into prayer and then I can get into the judges and we'll see how far I get. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for the freedom we have for assembling, being free to discuss your word, teach your word, use your word in our lives. We're grateful, Father, for so many blessings that we have. We ask you to help our country, uh, write our, uh, write, put her back together, help us go forward. Um, and we ask for uh, all of the, the people in our, our, our congregation, Father. We know we have all kinds of problems in the angelic conflict and individual issues. Uh, please touch our lives with your grace. I ask, Father, in particular, to give me words. Uh, I depend on your words, Father, to, to teach that they might please you and be instructive and at the same time be enjoyable and, and maybe laugh a time or two. Uh, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I said a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was three or four weeks ago by now. Oh, uh, uh, okay. There was that a little better. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I wasn't talking real loud either then. So, uh, uh, I, I'm. I think Julie t tells me that I'm not. I don't talk very loud. I people have told me that before. Um, they tell me that all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have problems with some people that that are talk real loud. There's a, a couple of guys at work, 
and I had to kind of stand back. Uh, uh, just my, my ears are sensitive. They, are, they, they already have uh, tinnitus or tinnitus, um, so I got ringing in my ears all the time. And then they had uh, loud, loud noises and um, anyhow. But um, uh, weeks ago, I, uh, uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to do anything with, with uh, Judges chapter 5. I look at that, of course, I'm looking from a human perspective. It's, it's, it's Hebrew poetry. It's real difficult. I don't know. So, well, I forget sometimes. The Holy Spirit can open doors. And, 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 and so we've got some really interesting things happening in Judges chapter 5. I won't be, i probably just scratch the surface because there's so much stuff there. But I, there's some stuff in there that uh, uh, I think is kind of interesting, neat. Um, and, and I think instructive uh, things that we should look for in our own lives and our relationship with God the Father. So uh, uh, let me start with uh, talk about Hebrew poetry and, and just quote Robbie Dean. Um, uh, this is Hebrew poetry. He's talking, and, and, and Robbie Dean, uh, he's taught uh, judges several times. And uh, he mentioned in one of his, his uh, uh, lectures that his master's thesis was on uh, a part of judges. So judges is something that, that, that means something to him or is important to him, and uh, so he teaches it. And um, uh, I, I, I rely on some of his expertise but there's some things that I, I just need to go look at a book and uh, let the Holy Spirit uh, point me in the right direction. Uh, poetic language makes use of a lot of idioms. It makes use of a lot of imagery, a lot of similes and metaphors that do not necessarily carry over from one language to another. So it involves a tremendous amount of skill in order to not only translate it, you can translate it word for word and then you end up with something of a wooden translation that may not make a lot of sense when it comes over into the English. And then you have to start working on your English to try and make it read as well as beautiful poetry in English. So it stretches the skill of a translator. Dr. Dean explained that there are different kinds of psalms. Obviously, we're dealing with praise in chapter 5. Within that category, you can have a declarative praise, which is based upon a specific act of God, which is what we have here. There's also a descriptive praise, about which Dr. Dean says in a descriptive praise psalm, the writer is giving general praise to God focusing on perhaps some attribute of God and talking about how great and wonderful and extolling the benefits and the blessings of God. So what we have here when we come to Judges 5 is a declarative praise psalm. The main idea of a psalm comes from this Hebrew word, which means to remember, and it has the idea of reminding us about the attributes of God, his person, who he is, and what he has done in human history. A word of caution and emphasis. I, I read that, uh, what he said there, and then I was thinking... Well, let me look up the words the word for psalm in Hebrew. Well, that doesn't mean memory. Well, because he's talking not about the word for psalm, but the central idea of the psalm. But the, uh, it means uh, to recall, to remember something special what God has done. And we've talked about that over and over again in Judges. Memory, memory, memory. Um, there's various from the from the tombs to the, and in this case, the, the psalm, the, the, uh, the things that God did. Should be, should be a reminder. And I kept forgetting. And I've also alluded to faith rest, which would cause us to focus on the essence of God and our relationship to God the Father, our Father. Remember that we walk by faith dependence on the Holy Spirit who takes us to fellowship with Jesus Christ in whom we are located positionally. Our position in Christ is empowered by the Holy Spirit and takes us to God the Father, the omnipotent, omniscient God. Here, specific acts of God are enshrined in poetry to be repeated as memory. Apparently, Israel had forgotten the great deliverance from Egypt. So God has repeated his deliverance from the Canaanites in a way that is reminiscent of the deliverance from Egypt. And there are parallels. Uh, I kind of mentioned some of those, but then I actually read a commentator, and he made a list of them. And she, here's this, this uh, Judges, and here's Exodus. Here's Judges, and here's Exodus. Here's, and it goes down, and whoa, there's a lot that's similar. The, according to Robert Chisholm, I mentioned him several times, he's a... Uh, a professor of Old Testament in, at Dallas Seminary these days. The juxtaposition of narrative and poetic accounts of the victory reminds us of Exodus 14.1 through 15.21, which reports and celebrates the Lord's defeat of Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. The similarity may be more than coincidental. 
for there are other literary and thematic parallels between Exodus 14 through 15 and Judges 4 and 5, suggesting the narrator of Judges viewed the Lord's defeat of Sisera as a reactualization of his mighty victory over Pharaoh. The parallels include, one, both accounts emphasize the strength of the enemy's horses and the chariotry. We heard over and over again that 900 iron chariots. And in the Exodus, they talk about the chariots of Pharaoh. Two, the waters of the Kishon River, like those of the Red Sea, are the Lord's instruments of destruction. And we didn't see that so much in chapter 4, but you'll, you'll we'll encounter that in chapter 5. And also, we, we read that in Josephus. Josephus had a magnificent couple of, of, of sentences on, on the storm and the flood. Three, in both instances, the Lord confused or routed, and I've left out the Hebrew, just put your Hebrew word there, uh, routed the enemy. Use the same word in both places. Four, in both instances, the enemy was totally destroyed. As the language of Judges 4.16, not even one was left, and Exodus 14.28, not even one of them remained, makes clear some of the same words. It was one word that's different. There are also parallels between Judges 4 and 5 and other parts of Exodus. Judges 4 and 5 reviews the Lord's battle with the enemy as they struggle for kingship over his people. Note especially Judges 5, 3, and 19, as does the Exodus account. And the passages there. The same Hebrew word describes the oppressive deeds of both Jabin and Pharaoh. So you, as I've mentioned, you have similar vocabulary that ties these two passages together. You've got to, uh, similar scenarios between them um, that also tie them together. Uh, now we get to, uh, uh, Robbie Dean gave a, a helpful outline of chapter five. He got on uh, this first page, he gives it in words, and then I put it in a, a little uh, numbers. The first major division is just the first verse, which gives us the title of the Psalm in verse one. Then the second section gives us, gets into the praise section, and he left out which, is a proclamation to praise Yahweh. And this is Judges 5, 2 through 8. Then there's a report or description of the deliverance. This is in Judges 5, 9 through 30. So the report of the deliverance, verses 9 through 30, and we will break that down a bit when we get into it. So here I just made a little quick outline based upon what he said. In the title, the proclamation and description. Before we delving into Judges chapter 5, I want to go down memory lane. And I want we're going to open the Bibles. And we're going to read Exodus 14 and 15 and then Judges 4 and 5. And you'll say, that's a bit long. Yes, it is. But because we're not, we're not Jews, we're not Hebrews that are familiar with that, this will help you be familiar with, with this parallel, be able to see it. So if you've got a Bible, we'll, we'll start with Exodus 14. Uh, like I say, I know we'll, we may spend a considerable time here, but I want to be, be familiar with, with what happened there and then what happened in Judges. And, and keep in mind the parallels. I want you to see them as we go across in your own Bibles. Exodus 14, verse 1. Now the Lord's... I'm going to change glasses. I got some new glasses. I really like them. The only problem is, is that my faraway glasses are for driving, and then these are computer glasses here, so I can see the dash, which is over here. It's not here. So if I want to, these are my, uh, these are my uh, my computer glasses. Yeah. Let me see if I can get this off. These are my computer glasses, and then my reading glasses. Uh, uh, oh dear. Yeah, there we go, and. Uh, uh, I, I had as a kid a book called uh, um, the, the Adventures of Professor Brainstorm or something like that. Uh, it's an English book. My, when I lived in Italy, we went to an English bookstore. My mom would buy me a book. And this Professor Brainstorm, he had like five or six different pairs of glasses, one for everything. And he was always losing one, and so he'd have to find get one and and and, and find another one. And then he was always kind of, and and he had uh, a copy of a book. That he kept losing, so he'd check it out from another library, check it in over here, and then and he, so he was constantly checking this book in and out of different libraries. I don't know how that would work today, but uh, 
Anyhow, I'm, uh, I guess that shows my age a little bit. Try vocals. <laughs> Try vocals. I don't, I, I, bifocals are, are bad enough. Yeah. And and I don't even want to try progressives. They're, they're you don't know what you're missing, baby. <laughs> uh, I'm happy with these. Uh, that works for me, and I, I, that's that, that yeah, that's all I need. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, cool saying, "I got I got glasses. Everybody in the room's very Herman, glasses. Herman got yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> interesting. Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pi mm -hmm. Haroth." between Migdal and the sea, and you shall camp in front of Bel Zephon, opposite by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the sons of Israel, they're wandering aimlessly in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and I will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And, and oh, over and over again, we've seen that, that phrase in, in uh, or we will see that phrase in Judges. That they will know that this is for the Israelis themselves. That they will know I am the Lord. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, "What is this we have done, that we have let the Israel the Israel go from serving us?" So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him, and he took six hundred select chariots. So we are now. Now he only had six hundred select chariots, but uh, the Canaanites had nine hundred iron chariots. There's that parallel. So he made his chariot uh, and took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt. And so he had more chariots with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Piharoth and in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. And we saw that word in chapter 4, I believe, uh, that they cried out and over and over again the, 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 in, in Judges. They get in trouble, and they cry out to the Lord. All right, and God comes running. Then the Lord said to Moses, It is because there were, is it because there were no graves? In Egypt, that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today... You will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Ooh, let's stop there for a second. That that uh, uh, when I when I it took me a while after I read this many many times, and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, that's what David said. That's where David got his. The battle is the Lord. Well, get right here. So you've got got it here, and then David said it. And then Je uh, Jehoshaphat, he says the same thing in, Chron in First Chronicles twenty or Second Chronicles twenty. You don't say it in Israel one of these days. Yeah. So so anyhow, there's a, there's a that that prom that promise as we say we use it from David, but here it is in Exodus, the the basic concept. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward." As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of, Egy of the Egyptians, so they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. <coughs> then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. The angel of God... Uh, the pre-incarnate Christ who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them so it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel and there was a cloud along the darkness yet it gave light at night thus the one did not come near the other all, all night then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea 
on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their left, on their right, and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up pursuit, and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen went in after them into the midst of the sea. It came about at the morning watch that the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve. He made them drive with difficulty, so the Egyptians said, Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Same kind of thing happened in Judges, that uh, the, the Lord caused them to be confused. They had the, 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 the water, the storm, and so then the, the, the Israelites chased them as they were fleeing all the way home. What's that... Uh, What's the three piggies and the little piggy went wee, wee, wee all the way home? <laughs> well, there, there you have it in Judges. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may come back over the Egyptians. So their chariots and their horsemen, uh, uh, over there, and so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them, not even one remained. And there's that, that duplication of that phrase from Judges, or Judges duplicates that phrase. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. Faith. And he, then, just like in Judges, you had Judges chapter 4 was the, the narrative. Here you have a, a, a psalmist. Uh, uh, and, and in one version of the NASB, it has a title here that says, The Psalm of Moses and Miriam. And uh, in Judges, it's the, it's the song of uh, Deborah and Barak. Interesting, a man and a woman. Here it's mostly Moses, and then in Judges it's, it's mostly uh, Deborah. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, and again, you, you'll see throughout here, there are words like this one, sing and sang, that are duplicated in Judges. So you've got, again, you keep having these parallels, and, and it's on purpose. Uh, God's trying to remind them, hey, I did this once before. All you got to do is believe me once, but I'm, guess what? I'm going to do it again. It reminds me of what's coming up in Gideon. Oh, just try this one more time. Or like even Abraham. How about if there's 50 people? Well, how, what about 40? And, and what about 10? And, and so here we have uh, uh, God's going to do it once again uh, and prove that, hey, you're my people and I'm going to take care of you. But you need to trust me. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse of his rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation, and salvation can also be deliverance. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And the, 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 I don't know that they should have said Lord. You could say Yahweh is his name, because that's what the Hebrew says. Pharaoh's chariots, and, and we're, we'll see if we, I don't know, we'll get there tonight. But uh, the, the Pharaoh shows up in, in, in Judges chapter 5. You won't see it in the English, but it's there. Uh, and and uh, it's it's uh, without giving too much away. I think Deborah's having a lot of fun when she when she composed that song. There's a lots of, of funny things in there, but some of it's hidden in the in the Hebrew. And and Pharaoh was one of them. Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea, and the choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Now, some people will say that in the Hebrew, it's not Red Sea, it's the Sea of, of uh, Reeds. But in the translations, it's, it says red. And of course, Paul in, in the New Testament calls it Red Sea. And there's other, other logic uh, that, that, so it's the Red Sea and that, that translation is, is good. <coughs> the deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the water, waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. 
The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. And we'll see that at the end of chapter 5 in Judges. Uh, uh, Sisera's mother talks about the spoil. Except he didn't get any. He was spoiled. <laughs> my desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. Oh, no, that, that's familiar. And redemption? We, we've heard that recently, haven't we? In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Anguish has gripped them in the inhabitants of Ephelistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab trembling grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Oh, Canaan. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone. Until your people pass over, Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased. Oh, another reference to, to redemption there. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place of, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and forever. For the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them, but the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her, and, uh, and with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider he has hurled into the sea. Let's just go to Judges chapter 5. We've already covered chapter 4, so let's go to 5, So because we haven't gotten to that, and we'll, this will give us an introduction. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang the day, that day, saying, and we are say, uh, singing, just like in, the, in Exodus, that the leaders in Israel, that the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers. I, to the Lord, I will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went down from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dipped, even the clouds dipped, dipped water. The mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. The Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. He's making references back. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted. And we'll have to ask questions there. Why did he, why did he bring up those guys? And the travelers went by roundabout ways. The peasantry ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose, a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen. Then war was at the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. The farmers only had pitchforks. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel, the volunteers among the people. Bless the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who travel on the road, sing. At the sound of those who divide flocks among the watering places, there they shall recount the deeds, the righteous deeds of the Lord. Memory. The righteous deeds of his peasantry in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake. Sing a song. Arise, Barak, and take away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then survivors came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came down to me as warriors. From Ephraim, those uh, those whose root is in uh, Amalek came down, following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Mechir, commanders came down, and from Zebulun, those who willed the staff of, of office. And the princes of Issachar were, were with Deborah, as was Issachar, so was Barak. In the valley they rushed at his heels among the divisions of Reuben. There were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear piping for the flocks among the divisions of Reuben? Oh, there are some people that didn't that didn't, fought, didn't uh, they heard the call but didn't come. There were great searchings of heart. Gilead remained across the Jordan. Why did Dan stay in ships? Asher sat on the seashore and remained by his landings. Zebulun was a people who despised their lives, even to death. Naphtali also. 
On the high places of the field, the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh, near the waters of Megiddo. Ooh, Megiddo, Armageddon. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought for, from heaven. From the courses they fought Sisera. The torrent of Kish, Kishon swept them away. There's that swept them away, just like the Red Sea. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on with strength. Then the horse's hoof beat from the dashing, the valiant, uh, the dashing of his valiant steeds. Cursed Merah, said the angel of the Lord, the preexistent Christ. Utterly cursed its inhabitants, because they did not come to the help of the Lord to help the Lord against the warriors. Most blessed of women is Jael, the wife of Eber, the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. And remember, uh, Eber was not a, a Jew. He was from a, a Midian. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand from the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera, she smashed his head. She shattered his and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he bowed. He fell. He lay. Between her feet, he bowed. He fell. Where he bowed, there he fell dead. Out of the window, she looked and lamented, the mother of Sisera. Through the lattice, why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. Are they not finding? Are they not dividing the spoil? A maiden, two maidens for every warrior. To Sisera, a spoil of dyed work, a spoil of dyed work embroidered, dyed work of double embroidered on the neck of the spoiler. Thus, so all the, thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord. Let those who love him be like the rising of the sun. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years. The first time I read through there and, and uh, um, read about uh, the mother of sister, you, you, you kind of feel sad for her. Here's a woman waiting for her son to come home. But then they're talking about a maiden, two maiden. Well, they're talking about rape. This is war. And well, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and, and the spoil, okay, so so here they're, they're going there. That's what happens in war, and, and especially in the, that area, is, is the war, okay, the, the men died, the women got uh, taken, uh, either raped or they became uh, concubines or whatever, and all, all of the, your possessions become their possessions. So uh, uh, that, that's the way it is. But the way it's said here, in, in the English at least, yeah, you think, oh, that poor woman. No. <laughs> that, that, what, what did they do to the Israelites? And they're trying to, 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 to get free from that. Anyhow. Uh, enough of reading. Uh, I don't have a lot of time left, but we'll, we'll, we'll get here and see if we can't cover some of this. Uh, I may uh, uh, go over a little bit, but that's fine. Uh, Judges 5, 1 which uh, Robert Dean says uh, is essentially a title. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, and sang. This word for singing is often used to people who recognize what God has done. It reminds me of that song, Count Your Blessings. Um, it is used in our parallel passage in Exodus 15. Uh, Exodus 15, 1, just, we just read that. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang, this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Same word, or well, one, one's, uh, um, uh, one's plural, but it, it, it's the same root, same root word. So Exodus 15, 1 has a similar function to Judges 5, 1. The actual song starts in Exodus 15, 1, unlike Judges 5, 1, but the verse breaks are not inspired. I would have broken differently, maybe. The word is used twice at the beginning of the Song of Moses and Miriam. And I mentioned that, uh, like, oh, I guess it was the NIV that's, that calls us Moses and Miriam. Or the Song of Moses and Israel, according to NASB, but uh, uh, I would have called it the Song of, of, uh, of Deborah and Barak, since they're both obviously in, included in that song. So let me go off on a tangent here. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to necessarily read here, but... And just from, from my heart is that uh, when God does things in your life, uh, sometimes you will be overwhelmed with emotion because uh, there are things like, and I've mentioned stuff in my life where I, I ran across uh, 
impossible situations, things where, okay, everything's going to go bad, and then all of a sudden it turns good, just because I trusted God. And sometimes you, you feel like you want to just um, drop to your knees and thank God. Uh, I mean, I, and I don't know, if, I, I mean, uh, I think as time goes on that you, you, you see that in your own life, um, that you have this overwhelming appreciation of what God has done. Um, and, and we see that uh, people write songs. I mean, here we have a psalm, in, in, but uh, uh, what, isn't there a psalm, um, uh, It is well with my soul? Um, I don't have the, 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 the history in front of me, but uh, the guy that wrote that, um, his, uh, he, he, his, his wife and daughters uh, were going over to the UK or, or England or whatever they call it then in the 1800s. And uh, he had to stay behind. This, the ship sank. His daughters died, but his wife remained. And so he went to join them. And, and uh, he, was, he understood um, that God was working in his life. And, and uh, so he wrote that song. And we've, I mean, you've got other songs, what are uh, uh, Amazing Grace. Uh, and and uh, I know that some of us, when we sing some of the songs, that we might get a tear in our eye. There's a uh, there was, there's one that I started to tear up that I didn't realize that I was going to tear up on was uh, on my father's side. There's a uh, I I love that song and but I do uh, uh, it just it, it it gets to you and that's that's what that's all I'm trying to say here is that is that uh, in your life uh, I'm and I'm hoping that you have that 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 situation where. The, the, there's an overwhelming appreciation for what God has done. You see God working in your life. And sometimes it, it, it results in things that you thought were going to be impossible to happen. But with God, everything's possible. All you do is just, just trust him. <clears throat> and uh, moving on. On that day, what day? It doesn't tell us. But from the context... Um, it should. We have to go back to chapter four. So God subdued Jabin the king of Canaan on that day, before the sons of Israel, and the and the sons of Israel pressed harder and harder upon Jabin the king of Canaan until they had eliminated Jabin the king of Canaan. So, so essentially, uh, when Sisera was killed, I don't know between that day or, or when when it says that when God subdued Jabin, I don't know if that was on the day that that Sisera died. Um, uh, but there was a day when Jabin was was defeated. Um, so and it says and saying so that that when that uh, uh, on that uh, um, where did I have that? Um, uh, so they and so at the end the last word uh, last word of, of, of verse one is saying and that's really referring to the content of, of the song. Um, I got off, off track here. Judges 5 2. For the leaders leading in Israel, for the people volunteering, bless the Lord. Um, and this, for the leaders leading, uh, that is a particularly difficult phrase. Robert Chisholm says Miller argues that this is a reference to the Egyptian, he misspelled it, but I quoted him correctly. Pharaohs uh, who exercised authority in Canaan during the 12th century BC. He translates the expression literally when the pharaoh's pharaoh. Here we go. I mentioned that pharaoh because the the word para or phara is is what's used here, and they got the noun and he's got the verb. Uh, so I think the Deborah's having a lot of fun here playing with words, uh, and I, I you can just see that here these these Brock goes and gets these tribal leaders and says, okay, you need to lead. Oh, I'm in charge. Oh, like pharaoh. I'm oh yeah. I'm gonna. Uh, uh, attend hut right face uh get your 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 pitchforks and 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 so here they're they're throwing out command just like a pharaoh so i think that deborah's having a lot of fun with the words here uh, but i say it is a particularly difficult uh for instance the uh the theological dictionary of the old testament it starts out with this phrase with this sentence the etymological questions associated with the hebrew para are too complicated to be discussed satisfactorily here and here you have the, one of the premier lexicons of the, of the Hebrew language, and they say, ah, this is too difficult to talk about here. You need a whole book to go through and explain that one. <laughs> so, okay. 
But like I say, I think, this is me, uh, I think that Deborah's having a lot of fun. And she's poking fun at the leaders, but at the end, uh, everybody, uh, they won, they, they trusted God. Um, but you can have fun at the same time sometimes. Um, uh, divine humor. So to go down to the people volunteering. So stop right there. Here we have faith. Uh, they Brock said, uh, 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 "I need you guys to uh, to go down. I need ten thousand volunteers to go down here and, and fight." And like I said uh, repeatedly before, uh, they're going to face an, an army that's that's whipped them before. Uh, ten or nine nine hundred iron chariots, uh, battle hardened, trained uh, combat troops, uh, and here they are with their pitchforks. Uh, they can they can. They can do their farming and, and shepherding really well, but when it comes to, to beating the armies, uh, you, from a human perspective, it, it can't be done. But so some of them, and we saw that when we read through the rest of chapter five, uh, that some of the tribes said, "Yep, yeah, I'll volunteer, I'll volunteer." So they took the volunteers from Zebulon and Naphtali. But there's some like Asher, Reuben, and Dan. They didn't they didn't respond to the call. No faith. But Naphtali and, and, and uh, Zebulon, they volunteered. So I, I think this word here is a word of faith. And we don't see that, uh, you don't see the word faith in text, and that, but that's the point from, say, like James in, in the New Testament. He talks about, show me your faith. Well, they just did. They volunteered. They're, they went to the front lines. And like, uh, uh, was it, uh, we'll see later in, in chapter 5, where uh, they had no care for their life. I'm, I'll die for Israel. I'm, I'm going to the front lines and we're going. Um, so in David's day, uh, using the same word, uh, he asked for volunteers to build a temple in Jerusalem. Now we know that he didn't. It was, the, it was his son Solomon that did. But in, in 1 Chronicles 29, 5, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? And the rulers of the fathers' households, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, and the commanders of thousands and hundreds, and the supervisors of the king's work, offered willingly. There's a word again. So this is volunteer. This isn't uh, like the military. They have something called voluntold. Uh, you're supposedly volunteering, but uh, the, your supervisor told you that you were volunteering. But this was a, vo a voluntary thing. They willingly did this, and they had a choice. They didn't have to go. Uh, or they didn't, uh, because we know from from Asher and Dan and and uh, Reuben that they stood behind and they didn't they didn't answer the call. So they didn't. So they these people voluntarily responded to Barak, who had responded to Deborah, who had gotten the message from God. Reminds me of uh, Romans twelve one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the miracles of God, to present your, your bodies as, living, uh, as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service to wor of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that it may prove the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, oh, and here's, again, I'm going back to Theological Dictionary of the New Testament for this word. For all occurrences of this of the word group in the Old Testament, as well as in post-biblical Hebrew and J Jewish Aramaic, the element of free will is determinative. Um, free will. The act of giving, the gift, and the decision are all free and voluntary. The basic meaning of the root and the dab can therefore be defined as prove oneself freely willing. Concerning the verb and the noun, it also says, in the majority of its occurrences, it means free will offering and refers to the offerings of private individuals outside the regular sacrificial systems. So there's a sacrifice, a free will sacrifice. There's a difference between Nadab and other synonyms. Nonetheless, this very difference made it an especially appropriate vehicle for expressing praise, joy, and thanksgiving to Yahweh freely and unconditionally. Um, and it can be a, uh, a, a free decision or choice for a particular action. Uh, and the examples include the willingness to go into battle expressed in the Song of Deborah. And let's, I'm not, I don't want to get into the, oh yeah, just the bless the Lord. I think that was uh, um, Barak 
as actually spelled, I, I would spell it with a Q and not a K, but bless is Barack with a K. Uh, so it would sound similar. So Barack is Barocking, a uh, different spelling. And I, again, I think they're having fun with the, with the, uh, the language there. And uh, I'll stop here rather than try and go on. We're already five minutes over. Um, but uh, I wanted to at least get to, to Deborah having fun with her with her Hebrew. Any questions? Okay, let's finish in prayer. Thank you, Father, for uh, the fun time we can have studying your word. At the same time, learning and uh, understanding your will for our lives. We ask you to help us understand and take these these words to heart that we might that they might help guide us in the future in our own lives bless america help her guide her uh, keep her free we ask these things in the name of christ amen